Hi and welcome, Max Mathias here. Uh, today we're continuing our Math for Econ series and today we're gonna to talk about multivariate calculus. Uh, the disclaimer, uh, as I make always with this, is this is not going to be an in-depth look at multivariate calculus and the theory behind it. Uh, for those of you that have taken like Calc 3, you know that here we're barely gonna be scratching the surface. Again, this is, think of it as an applied uh, tool for what you'll need for economics. So with that, let's get started. Uh, I will say, though, before we start, I highly recommend you watch both the Exponent Algebra and Univariate Calculus videos. Uh, multivariate Calculus, it can seem a little bit scary at first, but really it is just a simple extension of Univariate Calculus with one wrinkle. Uh, and then those need-to-know derivatives also apply here. So like the power rule, uh, how do you deal with logs, things like that, uh, all of those apply here. Those rules are still the same. And then Exponent Algebra will let you simplify uh, the derivatives uh, in other ways when they get a little bit more complex. So why do you need multivariate calculus for econ? Uh, we're basically always going to be dealing with functions of multiple variables. Why is that? Well, it adds an element of realism to models. Obviously, models are just abstractions of reality, uh, but adding more variables lets us, you know, add a little bit more realism and we can um, you know, at that point, then make predictions, things like that, looking at how certain variables change as opposed to just like a one variable model. Uh, it also lets us analyze trade offs that economic agents face in making their choices. If they're only getting to like, quote unquote, choose one thing to change, well, that's not very interesting. But if all of a sudden, there are multiple things uh, that they can be choosing. Well, now there's trade offs, right, which is kind of the core of economics. Uh, quick example, examples of functions you'll see, not necessarily in this video, but as you just kind of keep going in econ, uh, you'll see like a Cobb-Douglas production function. So that is labor to some power A, capital to some power B. You'll also see that a lot in like utility theory as well. We love Cobb-Douglas. Uh, and then you may also see a utility function. This is what we call quasi-linear x plus log y, right? Here, the x uh, will always be there plus, and then it's basically some concave function of the other variable. So again, you'll see these things. Uh, really, the functional form itself doesn't matter, but you'll notice already we're dealing with functions of multiple variables here. Um, Importantly, our goal is to use these functions to try to deepen our economic understanding of, you know, the world or whatever kind of model we're looking at. At the end of the day, we're not doing math just for math's sake. Although, uh, if you asked my undergrads that, they would think we're just doing math for math's sake. But I promise you there is a deeper point behind what we do. So what are we interested in in functions of multiple variables? Well, let's say we have some function of x and y. There are two things we want to know. The first is how the function changes if we only let x change or if we only let y change, right? So basically hold the other one constant, let one change, and let's see how it changes. And then how the function changes as I let both change, right? And is there an interaction there at all? Uh, the nice thing is that both of these kind of questions can be answered with the same tool, which is the partial derivative, uh, which is that interesting looking, you know, kind of D sign there, right? I took me a while to practice how to draw that. I know it sounds very weird that I practice how to draw things that in Greek letters uh, during my time. But uh, so it's not a like normal D like we would take for a uh, derivative of a single variable. It's a little bit funky, but uh, all good there. So what is the partial derivative? Well, to kind of bring this up, let's talk about, well, how does this function of X and Y change as only one variable changes? The partial derivative is actually very simple, right? We're taking the derivative with respect to whatever our variable of interest is. Here I'll say it's x, and you hold the other variable constant. We'll also want to know, you know, what y, or how uh, the function changes is just y changes holding x constant. So you'll always actually wind up having two partial derivatives here, or as many partials as there are uh, variables in your function. But at the end of the day, we're really just treating the other variable as a constant in taking the derivative. So if it's a plus sign, it's going to fall away. And if it is multiplied, right, or attached to our variable of interest, then it's just going to stay there in its current form, right? Uh, and then my advice here, think of plus signs and functions as a chance to take a break. What I mean by that is the biggest mistake I see students uh, make when they try and not only just multivariate calculus, right, doing partial derivatives, but also... Uh, in doing, you know, just normal derivatives in general, they try and do it all at once, right? And sure, if you can do that, awesome. 
but think of taking multiple quote unquote smaller derivatives and then add them together rather than one big derivative, right? So basically they're just trying to do too much at once instead of basically saying, okay, I have this one thing to the left of the plus sign, let me take the derivative there. I have this other thing to the right. Basically think of kind of taking two separate things and then the plus sign just kind of stays. So let's do some examples and apply this. So if we have some function, uh, which is just x times y, again, we're gonna have two partial derivatives here. Uh, we would say the partial of f with respect to x and then a partial of f with respect to y, right? Again, the one on the left is letting x change and holds y constant, so y is our constant there. Uh, and then the one on the right, df dy, is it lets y change and holds x constant, right? And so when we ultimately do it, when we do the first one, partial f, partial x, uh, the derivative of x times y, right, y is a constant, it's staying, and then if we just think of x using our power rule, it's going to fall away. So interestingly, uh, the rate at which the function changes as far as x changes actually depends on how big y is, right? If y is bigger, imagine it being 5, 10, 15, 20, you'll notice that the rate of change uh, is increasing there. And then on the same hand, partial f, partial y is just x. So it's a little bit counterintuitive, right, or it can be, we're taking a derivative with respect to x and y is left over, or we're taking a derivative with respect to y and x is left over, but again, they are just constants and they're just hanging around. Another one, uh, let's say f of x, y is 3x cubed plus 2y. Again, uh, as with the last one, I should have said this, if you wanna pause the video and try it yourself, go ahead. Uh, but here's the answer here. So this one, the plus sign is gonna do a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, partial f, partial x, right, is going to, using the power rule, the three drops down, we have 9x squared, and then that plus 2y, since it's a constant, falls away, right? So it doesn't change there. And then partial f, partial y, that 3x cubed falls away, it's a constant, and then 2y, again, using the power rule, is just 2. So that one was a little bit easier, uh, but when you do have x and y multiplied together, notice there, I should say, know that the other variable is probably gonna stick around, right? When you have plus signs, uh, one will probably go away. So the total derivative, so now we're moving to that second question. How does this function change if we let both x and y change? Uh, this is called the total derivative. Now notice this is just df. There's no partial there, right? We're asking how does the entire thing change? The nice thing is the partial derivative is still the answer. The way this works, the total derivative df is simply just the sum of partial derivatives, right? Any and all variables. So if with f uh, of x and y, there's going to be two partials. If it was x, y, z, there would be three, on and on and on, right? But if we have just some function f of x, y, then the total derivative is partial f partial x times dx plus partial f partial y times dy. So basically it's asking how does this function change as x changes? And then plus, how does this function change as y changes as well? So pretty convenient there. What's interesting, though, is that we aren't interested in the kind of total derivative on its own, but there is an application of it that we are interested in. And that application is called the implicit function theorem. So what we're going to do here is if we hold this function constant, right? So if we don't let it change, so its part or its total derivative would be zero, we can then measure changes in y as a function of changes in x or vice versa, right? The thought process behind this, right, is if the function itself isn't changing as x changes, y has to change in response to keep the equation in balance, or vice versa, right? If we're not letting the function change, if y changes, then x has to change in response, again, to make sure that the overall value of the function doesn't change. So implicitly, y is a function of x. If x changes, y's gotta change in response to keep that total derivative equal to zero. So the theorem itself explicitly basically just says, we're gonna start with that definition from the last slide, right? The total derivative is that sum of partial derivatives. We're going to set that total derivative equal to zero. We're not letting the function change. So all that does is just putting a zero on the left-hand side of the equation. And then we're going to try and solve for then dy dx, our kind of traditional derivative formula. So in solving for that, right, uh, the first thing I would do is move the entire uh, partial f, partial x, dx over to the left-hand side, divide dx, and then divide the partial, right? So ultimately you get dy dx is negative partial f, partial x over partial f, partial y. That is a really important thing to remember. Again, if you don't, I'm not a huge kind of fan of making people memorize things, but you can always basically just derive this, right? But if you memorize it, awesome, no issues there. So let's do an application here. 
if we have some function like we uh, had earlier, 2x squared plus y cubed, how do we go about doing this implicit function theorem? Well, you're gonna solve for the partials first. So partial f partial x is just 4x. Again, the y cubed falls away. Partial f partial y is 3y squared using the power rule and the 2x squared would fall away. And then you can just plug it into the formula. So that negative is going in front of 4x and then 3y squared. So as it you know, stands there, basically that's not a ton of information, but if you wanted to assign specific values to the uh, function itself, you know, 25, 37, I don't know, whatever, you can plug in values of x and y that would make it work. So at that point, you're actually getting a, uh, a rate of change that is a number as opposed to kind of just another function of variables. Uh, if we have something like x squared y cubed, if we go and take our partials first, uh, again, that y cubed is going to hang around because it's multiplied by the x uh, with our partial and then power rule. So we get 2x y cubed and then partial f partial y, the x squared is going to hang around. So you're going to get 3x squared y squared. And then when you plug this into the formula, you would get negative 2x y cubed over 3x squared y squared. This is where the exponent algebra comes into play. And you can just simplify that to negative 2y over 3x. Again, you could plug in explicit values for f of x, y to make sure that the x and y, you know, ultimately equal that. And that will give you kind of explicit rates of change for different values. Uh, but this tells you for any combination of x and y, what is going to be the derivative of y with respect to x. Uh, I'll talk more later. There is a reason why we do this. It uh, gives us a slope of indifference curves and also of isoquants, which are things that I uh, promise I will do videos on later in the future. So with that, thank you so much for watching. If you got anything out of this, please consider liking and or subscribing. Also, let me know in the comments if anything is unclear, if you want more practice problems or what you would like to see me talk about next. But with that, I'll see you next time.